Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this contact webinar. If there's any technical hitches, please do bear with us. We'll do our very best to sort that out as quickly as possible. Those of you who are joining by computer, laptop, tablet, or smartphone, you should now be able to see this introductory slide. My name's Derek Sinclair. I'm the Senior Parent Advisor at Contact's Family Finance Team. We provide a detailed advice and information service on all aspects of claiming benefits and tax credits for families with disabled children across the UK. I'd like to take the time, first of all, just to thank you for um, making uh, time in your busy schedules to take part in this morning's webinar, uh, which is going to be providing a general overview of the main benefits that can be claimed by families with a disabled child under the age of 16. Uh, by the end of today's session, we hope that you'll have a clear understanding of what the main benefits are for families with disabled children and the carers. Uh, you should understand not only what the most common benefits are, but whether or not you're likely to qualify for those benefits, and also how to access help or information uh, from services and making sure you're claiming those benefits or getting those benefits at the right rate. Now, because there's so many people taking part in this webinar, it's not really practical for me to take verbal questions from participants, so I'm afraid that you'll all remain muted throughout this session. If at any point, though, you do have questions, please feel free to use the question icon on your GoToWebinar toolbar on the screen. Um, that will allow you to type in a question in the text box, and that will be submitted to our webinar administrator, and then that question will be forwarded to me. And then during the course of the session, I'll review uh, the questions as they come in and I'll try and answer as many of the relevant questions as time allows. If there are sort of similar questions on common sort of themes, we might try and condense those questions together so I can answer as many as I can. Um, it may be that we don't have enough time to answer all of the questions that are raised during the webinar. What we'll try and do, though, is we'll try and summarize any sort of common questions, any common themes, and post answers to these questions uh, as part of a news story on the contact website and on our social media channels in a few days' time. And of course, if you are looking for benefits advice, um, you can always access information via our um, web pages on the contact website. We have specific pages on benefits advice. That includes a common questions tool, which tries to answer a lot of the most common questions that families have about the various benefits for disabled children. You can also get in touch with our advisors via our free helpline. You can uh, email questions, use social media to post questions, or just telephone our free helpline on 0808 808 3555. At the end of this webinar, a short questionnaire will launch. I would really uh, appreciate it if you could take the time to complete this, as it's really helpful in assisting us to plan sort of future online events. And we do intend to hopefully run some other benefits questionnaires uh, later this year. Now, um, before I start um, launching into the session in, uh, in full, I was going to ho hopefully ask participants a few questions, if that's OK. So what I'm going to do in a minute is launch uh, a couple of polls, which will just seek to ask uh, a couple of basic questions of participants. You've really just got to answer whether you agree true or false with a statement. So uh, just so I can get a sense really of what people's understandings perhaps are of uh, the benefit rules. So I'm going to launch the first question just now. If you can just take a couple of seconds just to look at it and to decide whether you think it, the, it's true or false answer. Just going to wait a few more seconds uh, to see if we have any more responses. OK, now I'll just share the results with you. So the question is uh, whether DLA is uh, means tested, is, sorry, not means tested. And I'm happy to say that 85% of people answered that correctly. So the benefit is not a means tested benefit. I'm just going to run one other uh, poll quickly. So your child needs to have a diagnosis in order to claim DLA. Is that true or false? So 87% of respondents think that that's false. And that is correct, actually. It is false. There's no need to have a diagnosis. Your child needs to have a condition. There needs, 
their extra the need for extra care or supervision does have to be caused by some sort of underlying condition but you don't need to have a diagnosis that's a really important point and we speak to quite a lot of families who have missed out on claiming DLA for quite a length of time because they've been told often by health professionals that they need to wait for a diagnosis first so in today's session we're going to be looking at disability living allowance in uh, quite a bit of detail. I mean, DLA for short is the main benefit for families with disabled children under the age of 16. And it's an absolutely crucial benefit for families to be claiming because unless your child is in receipt of DLA, your child simply won't be treated as being disabled under the benefit system at all. And you won't be treated as a carer either. We'll also look at what sort of extra types of help are available in getting around out of doors with a disabled child. We'll then move on to looking at carer's allowance, which is the main benefit for full-time carers. And we'll also spend a bit of time looking at extra tax credit payments for families with a disabled child. That's quite a topical issue just now because the government have just announced that more than 24,000 families in the UK are actually currently missing out on extra tax credits payments for disabled children and their families. So, so we'll be looking at that in a bit more detail later. And finally, we'll finish up by looking at universal credit, which is the new means-tested benefit that's replacing most of the uh, means-tested benefits and tax credits for working age families. So in terms of um, more detailed sort of consideration of DLA. So it, as I said already, it's the main benefit for disabled children and it's there to meet the extra costs of having a disabled child, whatever those costs may be. And we know from research that families with disabled children have much higher costs than other uh, families. Research suggests it costs up to three times as much to bring up a disabled child as a non-disabled child. So the idea behind DLA is that it provides a pool of extra funds that you can draw on to meet any costs that you incur as a result of having a disabled child. And you don't have to justify what you spend that money on. If it's awarded to you, it's accepted that you're the expert about what your child's care needs are, about what the extra costs are that you incur, so you can spend that money as you see fit. Now, DLA has two types of payment. There's a care component and there's a mobility component. Some children might only qualify for one payment or the other, but large numbers of children will be getting both components. Now it can be paid from the age of three months, at least the care component can. Um, if a child has a terminal illness, or if a baby is terminally ill, it's actually possible for a claim to be made from birth. In order to do that, you have to claim under special rules and you would need to um, seek a medical certificate called the DS-1500 as part of that claim. As we've already um, considered earlier in the poll, the benefit's not means tested. So that means it doesn't matter what income you have, it doesn't matter what savings you have, it doesn't matter whether you're working or not. Really the, the main thing that the benefit is interested in is your child's condition and in particular, how that impacts on their day-to-day -day functioning. Now, really importantly, DLA is never treated as income for other benefits. Sometimes families don't claim DLA because they think it, the money might simply be deducted from other payments they get, like tax credits or income support. But that should never happen because DLA is never treated as income. It's always fully disregarded. And in actual fact, DLA usually triggers additional payments. So if you received uh, DLA, then you might get extra tax credits or you should get extra tax credits. You may receive uh, other additional benefits as well. We describe DLA as a gateway benefit because it's a key that unlocks other types of support as we'll see later in this session. So DLA is obviously a very important benefit for families. But the reality, interestingly enough, is that less than 50% of disabled children in the UK are actually claiming DLA. And now it's true that not all disabled children would necessarily qualify. Some children may just may not meet the criteria to qualify for the benefit. But at contact, we speak to families every day on our helpline 
that aren't getting DLA when they probably should be. So we know that there are large numbers of families who aren't currently claiming who should be claiming DLA. And we wanted to know why that was the case. So in 2014, we carried out research uh, along with the Family Fund, uh, we spoke to um, 110 parents who weren't currently on DLA at that point to find out why. And I think before we did that research, we were um, really assuming that the big problem was perhaps that families hadn't heard of DLA and were unaware of its existence. But actually, when we actually conducted the research, we found out a very different picture. So actually, more than three quarters of people that took part in the survey who weren't on DLA knew about the benefit, they'd heard about the benefit, and they knew of his existence, but they weren't claiming for other reasons. And they, what became clear is that uh, there were sort of very important sort of attitudinal barriers or myths that were preventing families from making claims. And one of the key ones, I think, was that a lot of families didn't think that their child had the type of disability that would count for DLA. So what we discovered was that um, if your child didn't have a physical disability, you were a lot less likely to claim DLA um, than other families. So, you know, children who had autistic spectrum disorders, ADHD, developmental delay, speech and language problems, they were a lot less likely to be claiming DLA than their contemporaries that had physical problems. So there's clearly an issue that a lot of families think that DLA is perhaps aimed more at children with physical disabilities, and that's really not the case. If you can show that your child has extra care or supervision needs, it doesn't matter what the type of condition is. It's a benefit that's aimed just as much at children with those sort of so-called hidden disabilities as it is children with physical conditions. Um, at the time of the research, we also discovered that about a quarter of the families um, that we had interviewed hadn't claimed DLA because they were still waiting for a diagnosis. And many of them had been told by professionals that they needed to wait for a diagnosis first. And as we've already discussed, that's not a requirement under the legislation. So we'll look first at the care component of DLA. So this can be paid from the age of three months at the earliest. Um, it doesn't mean that all or even most children would necessarily qualify from the age of three months. Generally, it's true to say that the younger your child is, the harder it is to qualify for DLA. And that's because all babies require a lot of care and supervision, and you need to be able to show that your baby requires greater care and supervision than other children who don't have a disability. And that can be quite difficult with very young children. Having said that, there are some children that will qualify from three months. And it's not uncommon to qualify for a, a, a disabled baby who's maybe been tube fed, who might need oxygen treatment or suctioning. It's also very common for children who have seizures to qualify for DLA from a very young age children with uh, severe visual impairments might qualify, or those children that are born very prematurely. There's uh, no need for a diagnosis, as we've already discussed. Now that in order to get the care component of DLA, your child must either require extra care, or they must need continual supervision to avoid a risk of danger. Those are the two tests. One or the other of those must be met. Um, so what do we mean by extra care? Well, what the law talks about is attention with the bodily functions. And what that really means is anything to do with how the body works. So it not only covers things like help with eating or dressing, washing and bathing, but also things like helping a child deal with a visual impairment, for example. So if you need to help overcome a visual impairment, then that's seen as attention with the bodily function of seeing. It also covers things like help to communicate with others, to socialize with other children, or to help a child learn about the world about them. So all of these things are classed as attention with the bodily functions, and they're all counted towards this test. Now, the attention has to be of, I guess, what you would call a close or maybe intimate nature. So it usually has to be done in the presence of the child to count. 
um, there are certain things that can be done out with the child's presence. So, for example, if your child, child soils the bed and you have to deal with a soiled uh, bedding, then that generally would be classed as attention as well. But other than those kind of things, usually to count as care, it has to be something that you're doing with your child and in their presence. Um, but it doesn't have to be physical care. Really importantly, it's not limited to physical care and support. It can also cover things like giving verbal instructions, cajoling your child, reminding a child, prompting a child to do routine tasks. As long as those sort of verbal support is substantially greater than what other children would need at that age, then it should count. The alternative route to qualifying is continual supervision to avoid a risk of danger. So this is about where you're having to watch over your child to make sure you're, they're safe and perhaps at certain points intervening to keep them safe. Now, when we talk about continual supervision, that means regular or frequent supervision. It doesn't necessarily mean non-stop supervision. And what you need to be able to show is that the, the that regular or frequent supervision is reasonably required, not medically required, but reasonably required because there's a risk of danger either to the child or to others. So for some children, it might be that there's a risk um, of seizures or a risk of falling if they've got balance problems, um, a child who's got perhaps severe learning difficulties, maybe at risk of choking from constantly trying to put things in their mouth, there's children who might require supervision because their behavior places themselves at risk or perhaps as a risk to others. If a child's got very challenging behaviors, they might present a risk to their caregivers or to their siblings. So all of these things might lead to the possibility of an award on the basis of the need for continual supervision. Now, even if the risk of danger arises infrequently, you might still be able to argue that is reasonable to provide continual supervision, particularly where the episodes are difficult to predict, where you can't really take steps to minimize the risks and where the consequences could be very serious. What the decision makers in the DLA unit need to do is weigh up different factors. So they are looking at the frequency of the episodes, but they also have to look at how unpredictable they are and also what the potential seriousness of the episodes are. So the more serious the possible consequences, you know, the more dire the possible consequences, then the less important the frequency of the episode should be. Now your child's needs must also be substantially greater than other children of the same age. So even if they have substantial care or needs or a need for continual supervision, you must also show that that is substantially more than what other children of the same age uh, require. So the DLA is very much about explicitly comparing your child with this kind of notional child of the same age, a child who doesn't have any disabilities at all, and you need to show that the care is greater. So that you can do that in various ways. So for some families, it's that you're providing care that's totally different to what other children require. Sometimes it might be that the care takes a lot longer to provide for your child or sometimes it might be a case that the type of care or supervision that your child gets would only normally be required by children who are much younger. So those are the kind of factors really that the decision makers would be looking at. Now, um, the care component of DLA is paid at one of three rates and we'll look at each of those rates in turn now. So there's a lower rate of the care component and that's paid where a child requires care for a significant portion of the day. Um, and that usually means help for about an hour or thereabouts. Um, so for example, if we had a child maybe who only needed help say with um, dressing and washing, then that child might need help first thing in the morning and it may need help again uh, last thing during the day. But if that child didn't require care at other points during the day, then they would perhaps be a candidate for um, a lower rate on the basis that it was just for a portion of the day that they required support. 
to get the middle rate of care, you, you, you need to show that your child either requires um, a, a lot of care during the day or supervision during the day, or alternatively, you can qualify for the middle rate if your child requires some uh, care or some watching over during the night. So there's a you can qualify on the basis of daytime needs or on the basis of nighttime needs. Um, so in terms of the daytime, the test is that your child requires frequent care throughout the day. So that means the care needs to be provided several times and it also has to be spread across the day. So there has to be a sort of pattern of care. It's not just the isolated points. Alternatively, you can qualify if your child requires continual supervision to avoid a risk of danger, which we've already sort of touched on earlier. In terms of the nighttime tests, what's really important to point out, I think, is that you don't need to be up all night or even most of the night. You can qualify on the nighttime sort of grounds if you provide a relatively small amount of care, actually, as, as little as 20 minutes or half an hour can count. So the test is either that your child requires prolonged or repeated care at night, or someone to be awake for a prolonged period or at frequent intervals to watch over them. So again, it's either care or supervision, although they call it watching over. So prolonged means more than 20 minutes and repeated means that it's at least twice during the night. And please note that the test is not prolonged and repeated, but prolonged or repeated. So it's one or the other. So if, if you're up for maybe half an hour during the, the night, that would be prolonged care. And as long as that was substantially greater than other children of the same age, then you should certainly be a candidate for at least the middle rate on the basis of nighttime needs. So if your child requires a lot of daytime care or some nighttime care, you should be a candidate for middle rate. If they require both a lot of care or supervision by day and also some care or watching over by night, then instead they should be a candidate for the highest rate. Now, one of the questions that does arise um, as a result of these sort of tests is, well, what do they mean by nighttime then? Um, and that's a really important point, actually. Um, when they're looking at nighttime needs, it's not linked to when the child goes to bed, but when the adults in the household go to bed. So what, from their perspective at the DLA unit, nighttime starts when the household closes down for the night. And although there can be slight variations in patterns and in individual families, generally speaking, what they would normally see as nighttime would be a period that runs from about 11 o'clock uh, at night to about 7 o'clock in the morning. So if you've got a child who goes to bed at, say, 9 o'clock at night, and then you have to go and see to that care, uh, child and provide care at 10 o'clock at night, that is not likely to be seen as part of their nighttime needs. Uh, the care will still be taken into account, but it will be taken into account as part of the child's daytime uh, needs, not nighttime. I'm just gonna take a couple of minutes now just to check and see um, what questions we've had come in from participants. If you can just bear with me for a couple of seconds, I'm just gonna have a quick look. I'll come back as quickly as I can. Okay, so I've had a question from a parent um, who wants to know about what happens to DLA when a child uh, is approaching 16 and um, when will their DLA be likely to stop? So um, we're not really covering personal independence payment in any detail because this session is about benefits for child under, children under 16. At a later date this year, we do hope to run a, a similar webinar on benefits for young disabled people in transition. But to just to answer the question, so DLA is a benefit that we've already heard can be paid from the age of three months. Um, the benefit uh, usually uh, runs to a child turned 16. Now, what, what happens is in the sort of 
four months before their 16th birthday, um, the parent of a disabled child will start to receive uh, communications from the DWP telling them about the move to another benefit called personal independence payment, which is the benefit that replaces DLA for young adults. And what happens is that shortly after the child's 16th birthday, the child will be asked or in what they call invited to make a claim uh, for personal independence payments, which they do initially by phoning a telephone line and then they'll be sent a questionnaire. Um, now, it's not uncommon for a child to have an award of DLA that runs until the day before their 16th birthday and is then uh, supposed to stop. But what happens in those circumstances is that these special rules kick in and the DLA is temporarily extended uh, until the PIP decision is ready to be made, and that can take several months. So if your child uh, is approaching 16 and they've got an award that's due to run out on their 16th birthday, what you'll find is, as long as you comply with the process of claiming PIP when asked, that the DWP will um, basically ignore the end date and will continue to pay um, DLA for a temporary period until the PIP decision has been made, uh, and then um, the PIP decision will replace uh, the DLA award. Now, there's only two exceptions to that rule. If a child's terminally ill, they're not asked to claim personal independence payment, and the DLA should continue. Or if a child is in hospital at the point where um, uh, they're asked to claim DLA, or on their 16th birthday, then they don't have to claim until they actually are discharged from hospital. So the DLA continues to be paid until the date of discharge. <clears throat> now, some children might have an award that is due to last well beyond their 16th birthday. They might even have what's called an indefinite award with no end date. It doesn't matter what the end date is or if there's no end date, your child will definitely be asked are invited to claim PIP shortly after their 16th birthday, unless they're either terminally ill or a hospital inpatient. Okay, um, I think that's the only question at the moment I have, so I'm going to move on with the rest of the session. Um, and we're going to look now, we've sort of covered the care component, and I'm now going to look at the mobility component of um, DLA instead. So the mobility component, uh, has two rates, a higher rate and a low rate. Um, the higher rate can be paid from the age of three years. And I just want to be clear about this. It, unfortunately, it doesn't matter how severely disabled your child, child is. It doesn't matter how clear it is that they're never going to be able to walk. They cannot receive the payment of the higher rate before they turn three. A contact was involved in a test case a few years ago where we ch helped challenge this age limit, argued that um, it was unlawful and that uh, if, if there was to be an age limit, it should be closer to two rather than three. Unfortunately, the courts uh, upheld the age limit as it stands. So um, we are where we are, unfortunately, with that situation. Now, there's various... Um, different reasons that you might qualify for the higher rate uh, mobility. You can qualify if your child is unable to walk or if, and more commonly perhaps, if they're virtually unable to walk. Now, if you look at the law, what it says about this test of being virtually unable to walk is that the decision maker should look at a number of factors. So not just distance, but the speed of walking, uh, the time it takes you to cover a particular distance, the manner of your walking, so like the, your gait and balance problems that your child has. But in practice, I think it's fair to say that the Department of Work and Pensions do tend to prioritise distance over any other factor. And as a rough rule of thumb, what they will tend to do is they will award higher rate mobility on these grounds if you can show that your child's unable to walk 50 metres or more before the onset of severe discomfort. Um, so severe discomfort means pain or perhaps severe breathlessness. So the test is not really what's the total distance your child can walk um, before they have to stop, but the distance they can walk before they start to experience pain or severe breathlessness. So if your child 
can walk 80 meters before, and then they have to stop. But after 40 meters, they're experiencing pain. Then your argument is that 40 meters is a distance that they're able to walk for the purposes of this test. And the test is about how they can walk out of doors, not indoors. So if they've got problems with balance because of uneven pavements and things like that, that should be something that's factored into the claim. If their conditions made worse by weather conditions, so if things like wind or rain can really have an adverse impact on their ability to walk, then that is also another factor that the decision maker should really be taking uh, into account. You can also qualify for the higher rate mobility if your child has a serious risk of uh, deterioration in their health due to the exertion of walking. Um, now that tends to be applied um, to children with serious heart or lung conditions. Um, it's quite a difficult test to meet that because you need to show that the deterioration in their condition is so severe that either it would require a very lengthy sort of recovery time, and by that I mean actually months rather than uh, days or weeks, or that the recovery would require some sort of medical intervention, something like oxygen treatment, for example. Um, now, th there are also special rules that allow some children with severe visual impairment uh, impairments to qualify automatically and children who are deaf or blind. Um, and then we've got a growing group of claimants who qualify on the basis that they have a severe mental impairment and also challenging behaviour. Um, and I'll look at these tests in a bit more detail. So the Department of Work and Pensions described this as qualifying for high rate mobility on the grounds of severe mental impairment. And that's their language, not ours. Um, it's a very complex set of rules. There's like five main tests that you have to meet and you have to meet all five of the tests. So if your child only meets four out of these five tests, I'm afraid you're simply not going to qualify on these grounds. So first of all, you have to show that your child has a severe impairment of both intelligence and social functioning. And that must result uh, as a uh, from a condition characterized by a state of arrested development or incomplete physical development of the brain. So although I said earlier that you don't need to have a diagnosis to claim DLA, in terms of trying to qualify for the higher rate mobility on this grounds, there is a sort of diagnostic test involved. So you do have to show that your child, the, 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 the impairment that they have in intelligence and social functioning falls under particular sort of categories of condition. But it does cover things like autism. It's been accepted that autism, for example, uh, falls into this category. Um, your child must also get the highest rate of the DLA care component. So they must need both day and night care or supervision. And then there's three tests that are specifically linked to the types of behavior problems that the child has. So your child must exhibit disruptive behavior that's extreme. Um, often the DWP will conflate that, I think, with ch aggressive behavior or violent behavior, but that's not what the law requires. It's just disruptive behavior that counts. So if your child is likely to run into the middle of traffic, if they would try and climb up on parked vehicles or into people's gardens, if they would be likely to have screaming fits, lie on the ground, um, you know, arguably that's disruptive behavior that's extreme, so it should count in the same way. You also need to show that your child requires regular restraint to avoid a risk of danger either to themselves or to others. Now, case law would suggest that in order for restraint to be regular, it must not happen, it can't just happen out of doors. There also has to be an element of restraint needed indoors. And what we mean by restraint is also um, an interesting one as well, because that can vary depending on the individual child. So for a young child who's quite slight, then all that we might be talking about in terms of restraint might be a firm hold of their arm, for example. But if you have a hulking teenager, then um, in order to be classed as restraint, it might require something much more sort of involved in terms of restraining a child. 
Uh, finally, you need to show that your child's behaviour is so unpredictable that the whole time they're awake, so not just when they're out of doors, but when they're at home or at school or nursery, that someone has to be present and watching over them the whole time they're awake. Um, so if your child meets all five of these tests, you should have an argument that your child should be on the high rate mobility under these severe mental impairment um, rules. Um, just to be uh, to let you know that CONTACT does produce a, a specific fact sheet just on these rules. It's about six pages long, I think, and it goes into it in a lot more detail. Certainly quite a useful resource to have a look at if you're thinking about maybe um, looking at um, asking for an award on this type of uh, grounds. Uh, I should maybe mention as well, just before I leave the higher rate mobility, when we talked earlier about a child who is virtually unable to walk, as well as children who have physical problems in walking, it's sometimes possible to argue that a child who has interruptions in their ability to walk, so that's where they perhaps won't walk, uh, throw themselves on the ground, go limp, and um, won't make any progress on foot, if that's something that happens on a regular basis and it's not easy to overcome by bribery or encouragement, then it's sometimes possible to argue that that amounts to a child being virtually unable to walk. Um, there is a catch there though. Um, this test says you, your child has to be virtually unable to walk as a result of their physical condition as a whole. So you have to show that the behaviour problems, these refusal episodes or interruptions, um, these behaviours are, are caused by a physical condition or a part and parcel of a physical condition. But that is sometimes possible to show. So for example, if a child's got Down syndrome, which is caused by genetic damage, that's a physical condition. If your child's got a chromosome disorder and has these kind of behaviours, or indeed if your child's on the autistic spectrum, autism has been shown, to have a physical organic cause. So if your child exhibits these kind of refusal episodes or interruptions in their ability to walk, depending on how um, frequent they are and depending on how um, difficult they are to overcome, you may be able to show that um, your child should be classed as virtually unable to walk because of their physical condition. So if you don't qualify for um, the low rate mobility on, uh, sorry, the high rate mobility on any of the grounds we've just explained, your child might qualify for the low rate instead, which is payable from the age of five years. And the low rate's really aimed at children who may be able to walk, but who need much more guidance or supervision out of doors than other children of the same age. Um, you know, it can commonly be awarded where perhaps a child has learning difficulties or ADHD, perhaps where a child has sensory impairments, a child who's perhaps deaf might qualify, particularly if they're quite young or small and can't see over parked vehicles, um, children with problems with regular falling out of doors, with seizures like epilepsy might also commonly qualify um, for the low rate. Interestingly, the test is not how the child manages on familiar routes, but on unfamiliar routes. So it's about how they manage on journeys that they don't know well. Now, sometimes parents say, well, surely every child that's maybe five or six or seven or eight needs to be guided or supervised out of doors on unfamiliar routes. And okay, it might be true that young children do all need to be accompanied out of doors by their parents, but you still might have to provide guidance or supervision that goes well beyond just accompanying your child. So if your child has no sense of danger out of doors, it might not just be enough to be out with them and accompanying them. You might actually have to have a hold of their hand or their arm the whole time because they might just be at risk of rushing across the road and placing themselves in danger. So, you know, it is possible to qualify for these low rate awards, certainly from the age of five onwards. Now, um, get, we, we talked earlier about DLA acting as a gateway to other benefits. And um, if you get high rate mobility, then it can certainly lead to automatic entitlement to other types of help that would, uh, and getting around outside with your child. Um, and I'm going to look just quickly at three schemes in particular. 
So there's a motability scheme. Uh, that's a scheme that allows you to use the, the high rate mobility payment Rather than receive the payment itself, what you do is you you lease a car using the money that you would otherwise get to lease a car. You need to have an award of high rate mobility. Um, the lower rate mobility isn't sufficient, I'm afraid. And the award of high rate mobility must have at least 12 months left to run. Um, but if it does, then you have that option of having all or sometimes if, depending on the cost of the car a proportion of the higher rate mobility used to lease a vehicle the the cost covers not just the lease itself but also usually uh, service charges it covers um, insurance including breakdown cover what it doesn't cover though is the fuel cost so if you are thinking about using the motability scheme you have to factor in the cost of petrol or diesel as well if you have a car that's being used predominantly um, to meet a child's needs and your child has high rate mobility, you can also apply for road tax exemption. Um, the car does need to be used predominantly for the child's benefit. It doesn't need, mean that the child has to be in the car all the time. You might use the car quite a lot to run errands that the child benefits from. But what you can't do is use a car that's exempt for purposes that are completely unconnected to your child's disability, like also using the same car to go back and forth to work. An award of higher rate mobility also will mean that you're um, entitled to um, a blue badge for disabled parking automatically. You still have to apply for a blue badge, so you'll have to approach your local authority and make an application, but the only proof you should need to have to show is your letter proving that you've got a higher rate mobility award. Now, if your child doesn't get higher rate mobility, you might still qualify for a blue badge. Um, there are groups of children who qualify um, under particular circumstances. So for example, if a child's under the age of three, needs to be always accompanied out of doors by bulky equipment, then they should qualify. Or if they need to be kept close to a vehicle at all times because their condition is very, um, unstable and they might need treatment at very short notice and if they're under the age of three they should also qualify for a blue badge. In England uh, the government recently changed the blue badge rules so you can also uh, to make it easier for families with a child with a so-called hidden disability to qualify so uh, you can now be assessed by the local authority and if they agree that your child has great difficulties in walking uh, including where that's caused by psychological distress or where your child's uh, at risk to themselves or others when walking on short journeys, you can be awarded a blue badge by the local authority who would carry out a specific assessment. Okay, I think I'll have another quick look just to see what questions have come in. Uh, so again, if you just bear with me for a few minutes, that would be really helpful. Yeah, interesting. We've just had a question from a uh, respondent. Uh, Shona has raised an issue about her local authority not allowing blue badges for children with ASD. She says that they're ignoring the criteria. <clears throat> it, it's difficult because different local authorities seem to be uh, applying different sort of policies in terms of how they are assessing children. They certainly, a local authority certainly couldn't have or would, shouldn't have a policy saying particular groups of children can't qualify. If a child with an autistic spectrum disorder clearly meets these new criteria, either suffers severe psychological distress out of doors or is a risk to themselves or others, then they definitely should qualify under the new criteria. The criteria does apply across the whole of England and local authorities don't have the discretion and, and not to use um, the new rules that have come in. <clears throat> Where there are big differences is sometimes how they're assessing and what kind of information they're expecting parents to uh, provide. Um, I'm just going to very quickly just say a little bit about making a claim for DLA. First thing to say is where possible you should always try and make a claim by getting a form sent out by the DLA helpline. The reason for that is that they will date stamp the form with the date that you telephone. And if DLA is awarded, then they will um, backdate that uh, claim to the date that is, uh, you first telephoned, as long as you return the form within a six weeks window. 
if you get the form elsewhere and it's not date stamped, if you print it off uh, the internet or get it from a local CAB or something like that, then unfortunately, the date of claim is going to be treated as the date that the completed form first um, came to them. Um, it's really important where possible that you try and send supporting evidence if, if, if feasible, but you do have to be critical in kind of deciding whether evidence is supportive or not. Just don't, don't just send a letter because you've got a letter or a report from a health professional or an education or professional. You need to be clear that you agree with the information that they've written and that they're not underestimating the child's needs. Uh, because once you submit evidence, you know, it's going to be very difficult for, to roll back from that at a later date and say that you don't agree with it. Um, I'm going to move on slightly now. If, if we have time later, I might come back and talk about tips for actually completing the DLA form, but um, time is ra rapidly uh, galloping on. So I'm going to try and look at some of the other benefits now in a bit more detail. Uh, the, the main ones I'm going to look at now are carer's allowance, extra tax credits for disabled children, and I'm going to touch on universal credit as well. Um, so before I um, go on to carer's allowance, I'm just going to do another couple of quick polls. Um, I'm just going to launch uh, this poll now. Hopefully, you'll all see this on your screen. So you can't get carer's allowance if your partner is working and earning more than £123 a week. So it's Interesting that when it's a split almost, um, slightly more people think that that's false. Um, it is actually false. Um, you can get carer's allowance no matter what your partner's earnings are. There is an earnings limit for carer's allowance, but it only applies to the actual claimant themselves, not to their partner. So your partner's earnings are completely ignored in deciding whether you can get carer's allowance. Okay, so what are the main carer's allowance rules? So it's not means tested, but it does have an earnings limit. Okay, so when we say it's not means tested, that means your savings are completely ignored. It doesn't matter if you've got other types of income like maybe a private pension. Um, it's only really your earnings that are taken into account. And as we've already said, it's only the carer's earnings, not the earnings of a partner. Now, the earnings limit is a currently £123 a week, but that will be going up to £128 a week at the end of the first week in April. You need to be providing at least 35 hours a week care to a child to qualify. You don't necessarily have to be the child's pa parent. <clears throat> Other relatives can claim um, carer's allowance if they meet all the tests and if they're providing 35 hours a week care. It's not really about the relationship between you and the child, but the number of hours that you're providing care that's important. But if more than one person is providing uh, 35 hours a week care or more to the same child, only one of you can receive carer's allowance at any one time. Now, the child that you're looking after has to be receiving what's called a qualifying disability benefit. And what that means for children is that they either must be on the care component of DLA at the middle rate or the higher rate, or they have to be getting the daily living component of personal independence payment at either of the two rates. The carer can't be in full-time education. Um, now, the test there really is, uh, in the first instance, the Cares Allowance Unit will actually contact the school or college and ask, is the course full-time? Uh, and if the, co the course provider describes it as full-time, then it's likely um, that you're going to be refused. But you can also be refused if the course is classed as part-time but involves 21 hours or more supervised study. And supervised study doesn't just mean contact hours. It doesn't just mean the hours you attend classes or tutorials. It also can include study that you do at home, but which the course sees as being required or part of the reasonable expectations of the course. There's also certain immigration and presence tests that you need to meet. And actually, those apply to DLA as well as to carer's allowance. Generally speaking, you can't have be subject to immigration control. And normally, you have to have been in the UK 
for uh, 104 weeks out of the previous three years before you can be paid, although there are some exceptions to that. Um, younger children uh, are, are exempt in terms of the DLA uh, application of these rules. For carers, you can be exempt um, if you're returning from uh, living and working in an EU country or if you're an EU national, sometimes they can you can be exempt. Um, obviously, that, that is something that might change over time due to Brexit. Um, importantly, if you're entitled to care, CARES allowance, that means you're exempt from any work conditionality when you claim other benefits like universal credit. So you can't be expected to look for work uh, as part of a claim for universal credit if you're someone who's eligible or entitled uh, to CARES allowance. Now, it might be worth saying a little bit just quickly about the earnings limit for CARES allowance in a bit more detail. Uh, this is a constant issue because a lot of parents are on earnings that are maybe sitting just below the earnings threshold and then if they get a pay rise or sometimes when the national minimum wage increases above inflation, suddenly they go from being just above, below the earnings threshold to being just above it and then being at risk of losing all of their CARES allowance. Uh, the way that the earnings limit works is it's not a, a gradual thing uh, where you lose a percentage of your carer's allowance as your earnings goes up. It's like what we call a cliff edge. So if you earn less than the, carers, the earnings limit, you have the full carer's allowance payment. If you have just a penny more, you lose the full £66 carer's allowance. Um, well, what's important to bear in mind is that there are some things that can be deducted from your earnings when uh, you're claiming CARES allowance. So any tax or NI can be deducted, although most people wouldn't pay it at those kind of levels of earnings. You can deduct 50% of any contributions into a work or personal pension. Um, so if your earnings, so the earnings limit is currently 123. If you're earning 125, but you pay £6 a week into a pension scheme, three pounds is deducted from your earnings, bringing it from 125 to 122. And you would therefore not only be making provision for your future through a pension, but you would be making sure that you can continue to receive carers allowance in full. Certain childcare costs can also be disregarded, um, subject to a maximum deduction of half of what would otherwise be your earnings. Um, it's not just childcare costs for the disabled child that count, it's childcare costs for any dependent ch children that you have in your family under the age of 16. And it doesn't have to be re uh, re registered or approved childcare. Uh, the rules say you can't deduct costs if you're paying a close relative, but there's no restriction on you paying, say, a friend or a neighbor. So if you do that, if you pay someone, say, 10 pounds just to look after your child for a couple of hours while you're at work, then that money could be deducted from your carer's allowance. Uh, sorry, from your earnings when calculating carer's allowance entitlement. And also expenses that are wholly incurred in the performance of your duties can also be deducted. So if you have to pay for specialist tools or you've got a specialist uniform, protective uniform, then those expenses will be averaged out and deducted from your earnings uh, when working out your entitlement. Uh, I want to say a little bit about extra tax credits for disabled children because this is a huge issue. A lot of families are missing out on this payment. So the way that this works is if you're on child tax credit and you have a child who's awarded either DLA or PIP, then your tax, as well as getting the DLA or PIP itself, you also get an additional extra payment as part of your tax credits. And it's called the disabled child element of child tax credit. Now it's paid at different, the amount that you get through this is, is different depending on how what rate of DLA your child's on. So if your child's on the highest rate of DLA care component, you should get an extra 90 pounds a week in your tax credits. But if they're on any other rate of DLA, it should be an extra uh, £64 a week. So it's a substantial extra increase. In some cases, it can be as much or even more than the DLA is itself. Now, if you're also um, getting other means-tested benefits like housing benefit or council tax reduction, you should also let those offices know because they can add extra allowances onto your housing benefit uh, uh, entitlement and council tax as well. 
Now, one of the key issues here is that these extra payments tend not to be made automatically. So because DLA is dealt with by the Department of Work and Pensions and tax credits is dealt with by the revenue, they don't really talk to one another very much. So it's unless you actually tell the tax credits office that your child's on DLA or PIP, it's unlikely that they'll know um, that that's the case. So you could be missing out on up to £90 a week, depending on the rate of DLA that your child's on. So the key issue here is make sure as a parent that you take the onus yourself to contact the tax credits office to let them know that your child is on DLA or PIP. In terms of like getting these payments backdated, you actually only have a month uh, in which to tell um, the tax credits office. So if, as long as you tell them within a month of uh, getting a, a decision letter saying that your child's been awarded DLA, they will then backdate the extra payments in line with the DLA or PIP award. If you take more than a month to tell them, they limit the backdating to one month only. So, so a lot of families are missing out. And as I said at the start of um, this webinar, um, amongst all the budget paperwork last week, it, it, it came out actually that the Department of Work and Pensions and HMRC have done a data matching exercise. And as a result of that, they've identified that currently about 24,000 uh, families are missing out on these payments that should be getting them. So. Um, they're going to be taking steps um, to make sure that those families start receiving those payments be between now and next year, but we're still waiting for detailed um, information about how that's going to work and whether it's going to be fully backdated. Now, in the universal credit system, there are similar additional payments made as part of a universal credit award, but what you need to understand is that although with universal credit, you can also get these additional payments. They're not necessarily paid at the same rate. So under universal credit, there's a similar scheme. If you're awarded DLA or universal credit and you're getting universal, uh, sorry, DLA or PIP, and you're getting universal credit for your children or a child, you should receive this extra additional payment. They call it a disabled child addition under universal credit. Now, if your child's on the highest rate of TLA care component, it will be the same rate as it is under tax credits. You'll get an extra £90 a week. But if your child's on any other rate of DLA, middle rate care or high rate mobility, and they don't get the high rate care, then the additional payment under universal credit will only be £29 a week, not the £64 that you would get under tax credits and that's one of the reasons why many families uh, on tax credits can be worse off um, moving from tax credits to universal credit. There are other reasons as well but that's one of the main reasons that a lot of families can be worse off. It's the, the introduction of universal credit is kind of a disguising a particular cut and means-tested payments for disabled kids. So probably now would be quite a good point to perhaps talk about universal credit in a bit more detail. Um, probably most people have heard of universal credit by now. It's certainly the biggest change in the benefit system in a generation. Um, and it's basically about replacing all the current means-tested benefits for working age people with one single payment. So the benefits that are going to be replaced are income support, which is a benefit for low-income carers and lone parents, housing benefit, which is a low-income benefit for people who have, need help with the rent, child tax credit, which is... Uh, help for low-income families with children, working tax credit, which is help for uh, low-income uh, workers, income-related employment and support allowance, which is a benefit for, uh, means-tested benefit for people who are unfit to work, and income-based job seekers allowance, which is <clears throat> a benefit for people who are looking for work and are on low incomes. And these are all collectively known as the legacy benefits. 
And what's happening is that these benefits are basically being phased out and they're being all replaced by universal credit. So if we look at the old system, if you had, say, a lone parent who was caring for a disabled child and was on a low income and wasn't working, it would be quite common to see them, in addition to carer's allowance, DLA, also get income support for themselves. They might get housing benefit for their rent and they might get child tax credit for their children. But under the new system, they, those three payments would stop. The income support would stop, the housing benefit stop, child tax credit would stop, and instead they would get a single payment of universal credit. I would say that there's high degrees of anxiety around about universal credit at the moment. There's a lot of problems with the system. There's a lot of problems with endemic delays in the system, lots of common errors being made that are leaving families in financial hardship. There's also the issue that some families just are worse off on universal credit than under legacy benefits. And that includes um, quite a lot of families with disabled children, particularly those that are out of work. So there's a lot of uh, families are quite anxious about universal credit and when they're likely to be asked to make a claim. So at the moment, no one can be forced um, to claim universal credit. No one's going to come along and say to you, um, your benefits, your current benefits um, have stopped, all stopped, and you need to claim uh, universal credit instead. What happens at the moment is that you can only be really be asked to claim universal credit if you have a change of circumstances that would have formally meant you tried to make a new claim for one of the benefits that universal credit has replaced. So if you go along and try and make a new claim for housing benefit or a new claim for income support or a new claim for child tax credit, no one's going to force you to claim universal credit, but what you're going to be told is you cannot claim income support or housing benefit or child tax credit. So your only other option is to claim universal credit. It's your choice whether you do that or not, but that is the only option you really have. So by default, I guess, people have no option often but to make a claim for universal credit. The government calls this natural migration onto universal credit. And there are some very common scenarios that can happen that can lead to a situation where a parent perhaps feels they've got no choice but to claim universal credit. So for example, if you're a tenant who's claiming housing benefit in one local authority area and you move to a different council area, what happens is you're, because housing benefit is administered by each local authority separately, your current housing benefit claim closes when you move to a different area. Under the old rules, you would have simply made a new claim for housing benefit at local authority two. But what will now happen is you'll be told, well, that's a new claim and we're not accepting new claims. Um, and therefore, you'll be directed to make a claim to universal credit instead. Similarly, couples on tax credits who either separate or a single person on tax credits who starts to cohabit, what they will see is their current tax credits claim cease because tax credits is paid either as a single person or as a part of a couple. And if your status changes, your current claim stops. Under the old rules, someone who separated would simply go and make a new claim as a single person. But if they try and do that now, they'll be told we don't accept new claims anymore you're going to have to claim universal credit instead. Another case that might come up is a carer on income support. Their child has a renewal claim. They're not awarded middle rate care, perhaps. They might only be awarded low rate care on renewal. They not only would lose their carer's allowance, but after an eight week run on, their income support would probably stop unless they can get the decision on their DLA revised um, within an eight week run on. So in a case like that, where income support stops, the parent would have to come off income support. In the old days, they might have tried to claim job seekers allowance as a job seeker or maybe submitted medical certificates and tried to claim 
income-related ESA if they were under a lot of stress and pressure as a result of their situation. But these days, they wouldn't be able to make new claims for those benefits and would need to make a claim for universal credit instead. Importantly, if you move on to universal credit as a result of one of these changes through what we call natural migration, there is no transitional protection at all. If you're worse off, then I'm afraid there's nothing that the government will do to cushion that financial blow. One thing I should just quickly make clear is there are very few exceptions to um, or very few people who are exempt from universal credit. But there is one group, and that's certain disabled adults who already get a legacy benefit that includes a payment called a severe disability premium. So if you're a disabled adult and you get this payment called a severe disability premium as part of a legacy benefit, it means you're exempt from universal credit and can still make <clears throat> new claims for all the other legacy benefits. Now, what's the longer term aim with universal credit? Well, the government's plan is that everyone, all existing legacy benefit claimants will be moved onto universal credit at some point. Now, that process hasn't really started fully yet. There's currently a pilot of only 10,000 claimants um, that's underway at the moment in the Harrogate job center area, but it might be um, moved to other areas. So there's currently this pilot that's supposed to be working uh, up into the summer. And then the current stated objective of the DWP is that uh, starting from July 2020, there's going to be this process where everyone who's on a legacy benefit will be gradually asked to move on to universal credit. So they'll receive a letter saying that on a particular date, their legacy benefits are going to stop and they will need to make a claim for universal credit um, instead. Now, the current timetable, July 2000, is that that process will start in July 2020 and be completed by September 2024. But I think there have to be very uh, grave reservations about um, them meeting that timetable. In fact, buried in amongst some of the budget documents last week, there was a suggestion that uh, the, the end date for managed migration to universal credit might be have to be pushed back to 2026. And I think it's also probably unlikely that large numbers will start to be moved over in July 2020. Um, the pilot was supposed to uh, involve 10,000 claimants, but my understanding is that as of the turn of this year, less than 100 claimants had actually been moved on to uh, universal credit. So it seems to be... Um, very badly delayed. So those dates, although they're still the official dates, uh, I think we could, there has to be a degree of scepticism about whether that's going to be uh, what the situation actually is. I, I suspect both dates will probably be pushed back. Um, we're also not sure yet how managed migration will, will work. You know, How will they move these millions of families who are all on these legacy benefits over onto universal credit? Um, you know, will they prioritize particular groups or will it be done uh, area by area? Um, I, get, I suspect if it follows previous patterns, it probably will be done job center by job center, but we simply haven't had that confirmed yet. One important difference um, between transitional, uh, is between managed migration and natural migration is that if you if you are moved by them as part of this process, so if the DWP contact you out of the blue and they move you onto a universal credit themselves via this managed migration uh, process, you will be entitled to transitional protection. So what that means is that if you would get less money on universal credit than you would have previously or were getting previously uh, under the legacy benefits, you get a top up. So if you know if you had um, legacy benefits totaling 350 pounds and under universal credit you're entitled to 300 pounds, they have to give you a top up of 50 pounds a week so that you're no worse off on the date of transfer. Now there's no set 
time limit on how long the transitional protection will last. It will be open-ended. Certain things can bring transitional protection to an end, like uh, separating from a partner or starting to cohabit, moving into full-time work. The other thing about transitional protection, though, is it won't be uprated with inflation. So it's the payment that you get will be frozen. So over a period of time, it will be worth a lot less. So families will be worse off due to the inflationary effects over time. So, you know, a transitional top up of £20 a week will be worth a lot less in five years time than it would be worth just now. OK, so I'm just going to um, have a quick review of the, some questions that have come in recently, if you just bear with me for a minute. So um, I've got a question from David who's asking, why is the carers component of universal credit less than the standard amount of carers allowance itself? Um, I'm not sure I can give an authoritative answer on that, David. I mean, I think the, the gov it, it kind of models itself on what happened before. So under the old benefit system, if you were on means-tested benefits and like income support and you were awarded carer's allowance, you wouldn't gain by the full £66. Instead, you would get something called the carer premium, which meant you were tending to gain by about £36 a week if you were on means-tested benefits. So some of the carer's allowance was being clawed back, but not all of it. And I think that's the model that they've used for universal credit. So when you, if you're on universal credit and you're uh, entitled to carer's allowance, or if you're awarded carer's allowance, then you will get the £66.15. It is treated as income and deducted from your universal credit. But to make it worthwhile and to, to ensure that you get some benefit from being a carer, they do give you this additional amount called a carer's uh, element, which is worth about £36 extra. Uh, Vinod also asks, uh, the extra tax credits that we talked about for a disabled child, so the disabled child element, is it means tested? Well, that's a good question, Vinod, and the answer is um, it's certainly linked to income. Uh, it's not capital shouldn't be an issue, but your income will have a bearing on whether you would access this. Um, the extra tax credit payments, it's not a standalone payment. It can only be awarded as part of a tax credit award. So what happens is um, if you're already on, if your income is low enough that you're already on tax credits, then you will get the full amount of the extra payment. If your income is currently too high to get tax credits, then, um, well, the problem is you, you simply can't make a new claim anymore. So um, you'd have to go down the universal credit route instead. So what, yeah, whether you get the payment either under tax credits or universal credit will depend on your household income because it can only be awarded as part of either a tax credits or a universal credit award and they are uh, certainly tax credits is a, an income related benefit universal credit is fully means tested um, so we're coming to the end of the session uh, now. If you have any other last questions that uh, you want us to look at, um, try and get them in quickly and I'll try to answer them. If they come in after um, the session's finished, I'll ha we'll certainly review them. And if we feel um, we can answer them uh, for you, we'll post the answers along with um, on the same um, web page as the actual recording of the session itself, which will happen um, in the next couple of days. And we will email um, all the participants to tell them how to access that. So um, in terms of getting other support or help with benefits issues, um, often you, you can access help locally. Citizens Advice Bureaus um, will generally provide advice um, on benefits. Uh, I know that often there's issues with people not being able to get access to a CAB um, or then just having waiting times that mean it's not really practical to get help at the time you need it. It's also worth looking to see if there are other options. There are sometimes other independent advice centres in your area. Um, 
you can use something called Advice Finder in the Turn to Us website, which you can search for local benefits advice services in your postcode. But you can also get advice from us. So contact the organization um, who are running this webinar. We provide advice and information on all aspects of claiming benefits. Um, you can access that either via our free helpline, so you can phone and speak to an advisor over the telephone, or you can access uh, information via our website. So we have um, a whole suite of publications about various aspects of the benefit system. We have a common questions tool, which tries to set out the sort of most common questions that uh, parents will tend to ask and we try and provide a detailed answer to those questions. So hopefully, um, you know, we provide a fairly comprehensive service trying to provide support to parents around these kind of issues. And um, if the questions you wanted to ask have not been answered today, we'll do our level best to provide you with detailed information via these sort of channels. And just before I um, finish up, I've had another question from Vinod just asking, can people who are receiving carers allowance and DLA be migrated to universal credit? So um, carers allowance and DLA are not the benefits that are being replaced. So if you only get carers allowance and DLA, you wouldn't have to move on to universal credit. But if you're on carers allowance and DLA, and also on the legacy benefits, like tax credits, housing benefit, income support, <clears throat> then yes, at some point you will be migrated. The fact that you're getting CARES allowance or DLA doesn't protect you from having to move from your current means-tested benefits over onto universal credit. Sean is also asking um, a very pertinent question at this point in time, if someone loses their job due to coronavirus, is the waiting time for universal credit the same? <clears throat> um, I guess I'll, I'll have to double check this to make sure and I'll post an answer. Um, my understanding is yes, at the, at the moment they've not done anything to change that the rules that see most people who claim universal credit credit wait four to five weeks before they receive um, the first payment. Partly that's a problem because the benefit is always paid monthly in arrears um, and I've not seen anything yet um, that has suggested that that's changed. There have been a number of changes they've introduced as a result of the coronavirus, allowing people to receive benefits like statutory sick pay and employment and support allowance a bit quick, more quickly. They've also announced um, that people who would normally have to see a face-to-face -face assessment, medical assessment for things like PIP or employment and support allowance um, will no longer have to see someone. It will just be a paper-based assessment, but that was only announced yesterday. So these changes are happening very rapidly and I think they will continue to happen very quickly. Um, so as I say, I'll review that um, today after the webinar and I'll post a confirmation about that with the other material. Um, but as far as I'm aware, uh, unless something's happened this morning that I haven't seen yet, I think the waiting time for universal credit is still the same. Um, someone else has also asked about um, carers allowance and state pension contributions. Um, so I'll just explain quickly what happens. If you're on carer's allowance, then you automatically receive a class one credit for national insurance. What that means is um, the government credits your national insurance record so that you're not disadvantaged by not working. You get a credit that has the same sort of value as if you'd worked and paid a full stamp. So when you retire, it means that um, you shouldn't lose out as the as a result of having been on carers allowance and not working for a period of time. Um, and that should happen automatically. You shouldn't have to do anything. If you're on carers allowance, it will happen automatically. If you're not on carers allowance, there's also something called a class three credit that you can claim if you provide more than, I think it's 20 hours care to somebody. Um, the class three credits though, you do have to um, make an application for normally. Um, but you can find more information about the detail on that um, online. Um, and I'll make sure I put a little bit about that also 
on our um, information linked to the actual webinar itself. Okay, folks, so we're rapidly running out of time. Um, what I'd like to say, first of all, is just thanks very much for taking the time to attend with, uh, the webinar with us. We really appreciate it, particularly at this moment in time when there's so much else happening in people's lives, so much other stresses and things to worry about that uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to um, attend the webinar today. So thanks very much um, and enjoy the rest of your day.